Among the areas shaken up by the coronavirus is Boston's housing market. The surge in prices and new supply has given way to widespread anxiety among renters and property owners. Among those leading efforts in response is Boston City Councilor who represents Beacon Hill, the Back Bay, the Fenway, and Mission Hill. We'd like to welcome Kenzie Bach. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Councilor. Thanks so much for having me. Councilor, one of the things uh, that you came up with uh, recently was support for attempts by the mayor to get housing for families who are at risk of displacement, families with children in the Boston public schools. They're being given vouchers, but as you very well know, having a housing voucher for rental subsidy doesn't mean it's easy to find a place to live. So what do you want to, people to do about that? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so the situation, as you described, we've got 500 families right now with vouchers in the city who are in shelter. Um, and can't use those vouchers. And they can't, well, they can use them, but they can only use them if a landlord takes them. Um, and so one of the things that um, the Boston Housing Authority and I and others are really trying to amplify is that if anybody in the city has a vacancy right now, whether it's you know a triple decker that you've got a vacancy in or you have a large multifamily portfolio, really reaching out to the housing authority about opportunities to house those families is just a super important act of human solidarity right now. Um, and also, it comes with the federal government guaranteeing the rent, right? So this is the federal voucher program. And in a time of a lot of uncertainty for many of our um, property owners, it's, I think, uh, a great source of security there too. So I think there's both a humanitarian um, and a financial reason. And often our families, you know, there's a long tradition of discrimination against our voucher holder families. And also there are a bunch of administrative burdens. So in the normal overheated Boston housing market, it's often hard for them to kind of get a look. But I think that in this moment where a bunch of property owners may be sitting with a vacancy and the normal churn in the market isn't happening, it's a great opportunity to make that match and let our families be safe in this crisis. Well, I, I know we have all these college students who've disappeared, at least temporarily, but, but where else would you see potential for vacant units in the housing market? Yeah, so I think the students are a huge aspect. I mean, there's a lot of housing where it's normal cycle is student housing and then student sublets for the summer. And I think all of that is really um, up in the air right now. I think maybe, you know, somebody might have bad timing and they've, they've just had a bunch of new units come online and no one's living in them yet. Um, you know, and then there is also, we have a low vacancy in the market, but we do have a kind of standing 2% vacancy. And uh, there, and those units right now, again, the churn's not happening. So, so I think it's a, it's, it's almost like the music stopped, right, in the musical chairs game, and we've got people without chairs. But we also have actually a bunch of chairs that are open, and um, it's, it's the most immediate way that we can get those families safely. I'm, all, I'm, I'm also thinking of, of these units that were used uh, legally or not for short-term rentals. Yes. No. If you have a short-term rental, well, and and frankly, there's lots of the short-term rental folks who. Uh, they stopped being able to rent them on December 1st, um, and now they're still in the process of figuring out what to do with those units. So I think it's a totally natural time to return them to the long-term stock. I think it's also worth mentioning for people who haven't paid attention for a while that Boston Housing Authority actually changed its payment standards for federal vouchers uh, last year, such that now they're competitive with market rents in most neighborhoods of the city. Uh, I want to ask you about other things that are going on in the housing market because as, as you're well aware, uh, renters uh, don't have money to pay the rent in many cases now. Uh, property owners don't have money to pay the mortgage. They're almost in the same boat a lot of the time. Uh, what would you like to do about that in other ways? Well, you know, the Boston City Council um, passed a resolution supporting a moratorium um, on rents and on, um, evictions and, and foreclosures. And I think in general, you know, we're looking for, we don't have the authority to pass such a moratorium, um, but we're really looking for the state and federal partners to step up and think about how to make it, you know, this is, this is happening to people on both owners and renters, right, through no fault of their own. I mean, this is exactly the definition of a sort of uh, uh, out of everybody's control type of event. And honestly, that's what we have government and a safety net for. Um, and we step in with disaster relief, right? And we make people whole and we, and we step in, you know, in situations of, of war, which we've been lucky not to have on the home front in this country for a long time. But, you know, a pandemic is like that. It's this kind of disaster that's beset us. And so I think, you know, in the immediate term, we're really looking for the state um, to pass a strong piece of legislation 
around a moratorium on evictions and foreclosures. Um, but I think in the longer term, we've got to figure out how to how to help everybody dig out of that hole together. Should they uh, put a, a real freeze on evictions, or uh, would that maybe, as, as property owners contend, uh, let too many people who don't need help try to take advantage of it? I think this isn't the time where we can, we need to be worried about that issue of of people taking advantage of something. I think the reality people have to remember is that when the whole system of eviction relies on the idea that you know it's a it's a threat that maybe is going to make people behave or pay their rent or whatever and then you know for it to be effective you have to be able to actually evict the people and have them out on the street we cannot from a public safety perspective from a public health perspective have people losing their housing right now and the state is not going to spend resources you know evictions are executed at the ultimate moment right by the sheriff's office like the state the public is not going to spend time getting people out of their housing when right now exactly what we need to be doing is getting people into housing right that's why we're building these extra beds for the like individual homeless population that's why i'm here saying please if you have a vacant unit rent it to a family i mean we've just we've got to be going in that direction of getting everybody safely housed and so i just i don't think that the kind of I think there are good reasons to question it even in ordinary times, but I think certainly in these extraordinary times, we can't be talking about evictions as a piece of an incentive structure. We're just way beyond that. Now, I, I know the owners will, will say that even if they did file a notice to quit, there's no way the judge is actually gonna tell that tenant to leave right away at least. But what's going on in the mind of the renter when they get that? Maybe they don't understand that particular aspect. Almost always, I think, tenants are um, extremely scared by notices to quit. Um, and that's because when you read a notice to quit, it says you need to leave, right? I mean, it's a, it's a legal sort of jargon piece of paper that I think those in the industry know is just the beginning of a process, but your average tenant hasn't, you know, experienced that before. And we definitely have gotten, in this crisis at my council office, panicked calls about notices to quit. And I just think the amount of emotional anxiety that everybody is carrying right now is huge. And when you add on top of that, the potential, people feeling that they might become homeless in this crisis, it's just like too much to bear. And I think, and, and for us, you know, if we get one of those calls in my office, we're gonna spend a bunch of time reassuring the person, helping them to understand what their rights are, helping them to understand that the courts are closed. But that's an enormous amount of legwork, you know, just to kind of get back to where you were before. So I, I don't think that um, moving forward on the clock in terms of notices to quit uh, makes sense right now. In the medium term, you and some other counselors are, are looking at relief through property tax abatements. So what are you thinking about with that? So that's, so uh, Councillor Wu and Edwards and I called for a hearing um, to discuss that yesterday. Um, and we, we called yesterday for the hearing, we haven't had it yet. Um, I think, you know, it's a really tricky issue and that's part of why we wanna have a hearing on it because we've got, we've got all of these property owners who are just experiencing a really difficult economic crisis right now. And, it, and you know, and when you look at that, you wanna help and one of the levers that we could pull as a city is some kind of targeted relief for property tax, right? On the other hand, we're also looking at these enormous costs on the city side in terms of core city services. And those serve everyone in the city, including people who don't own, which is the majority of Bostonians. Um, and so when we look at, you know, and there are things that the city's gonna need to spend a bunch more money on. I mean, food access is an example. Um, and so, you know, when you're thinking about the provision of those uh, basic city services and the fact that property tax is the way that we underwrite the vast majority of our city budget, um, you know, you have to be sort of careful. So I think that the point of the hearing is to try to think about what would a targeted approach to that be? Do you think about, is there something you can do for landlords who are giving rental relief, you know, to their commercial or residential tenants? I think we all see the ways in which landlords bills and rent renters bills are tethered very tightly in this crisis. Um, and so thinking about how could the city help there, I think makes a lot of sense, but we also just really have to be mindful that property taxes, most of what we pay for everything that we're paying for right now, our first responders, you know, the schools, the whole apparatus, um, and, and the other sources, which are, are ones that go up and down with the economy that are likely to be significantly down next year. You, you chair the main budget committee on the council and the mayor has just filed a plan with a scaled down budget increase to only about four and a half percent for the coming year. Uh, 
do you think it's really going to be able to go even that high? Um, I, I, I wish it were. My instinct is that um, that number is going to have to get revised downwards. I, I'll say that on the, about the mayor's budget office that you know they really they did enormous work to uh, to change very quickly what they had been projecting a month ago out to come out with what they came out with this week. Um, and as you say, they've made it a more modest increase. I think that um, you know none of us know exactly where we're going to be in a month in two months economically. Um, and so it's just, this is gonna be a strange budget season because it's gonna be that sort of evolving guesswork in terms of revenue. Um, so the, the mayor's, um, he introduced the budget this week. Now it goes to a process of council scrutiny. So what we'll be doing is next week having an introductory set of hearings on the budget and then doing a bunch of council working sessions, sort of raising our questions and, and uh, issues and then have more hearings in May. Um, and the council needs to vote on a finished budget by June. I very much expect us to be partners in that conversation about how revenue is evolving. Um, and I think, unfortunately, we usually look, you know, for a revised, if there's a revised budget in June, we are hoping that it's one that's revised upwards. Um, and I think this is going to be the first time in a decade that we are probably looking at a budget that gets revised downwards. Um, and so we just really need to be having a very active conversation about that. Finally, I want to ask you about some of your impressions walking around the neighborhood, the stillness of a historic synagogue at Passover, or the sound of bagpipes amplified by the brick of Beacon Hill. What's it feel like to you? Um, you know, it's, a, it's, it's eerie. Um, it's obviously, I represent a beautiful set of neighborhoods, um, and they are great to walk around. And I've, uh, I've been doing some, um, actually some food access deliveries for family families in our uh, district who are in need right now. And so I've still been bopping around a fair bit myself. Um, and there's something poignant about knowing that so many of the faces that I know and love are, they're there, they're just behind the doors, right, as I walk by instead of on the street. Um, but it's uh, it's been amazing to see the the ways that community is still evidencing itself. I mean, you know, there was a there was a little girl named Anna who turned 10 in my neighborhood recently. And I knew that because there were all these windows and flower boxes with signs that said, happy 10th birthday, Anna, right? Because people were trying to um, uh, make it fun for her. And you alluded to the fact that we've got a mystery uh, Saturday evening bagpiper wandering Beacon Hill these days, which is lovely and something that everybody kind of comes out on their stoop for. Um, yeah, so I, I've really seen people pulling together. Um, but it, it's very hard not to be able to be together.